that God will take you through this crisis. Welcome to City of David, a highly innovative church with a vision of making disciples and raising leaders. We believe in the power of God's Word to transform lives. This moment, join us as we welcome the ministry of our senior pastor, Dr. Joe Tacon. If you are watching from around the world, thank you for joining our services this morning. Turn with me to the book of Luke chapter 23, 39 to 43. Then one of the criminals who were hanged blasphemed him, saying, If you are the Christ, save yourself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Do you not even fear God, seeing you are under the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. That's an interesting story I, I read, and I, I want to read that story for you. Um, the story of a young man called Johnny, who was a very dull boy, his peers called him father of fools. When he was in private school, he got the following results. Listen, maths, 2%. English, 5%. Science, 0%. Social sciences, 1%. The parents were distraught. They took him to a government school, and he got the following results. Maths, 0%. English, 1%. Science, 0%. Social sciences, 0%. His parents were very disappointed, but decided to give him one more chance. They put him in a Christian school, even though they were not Christians. The first term, John passed and was the first in the class. Math, 90%. English, 93%. Science, 95%. Social sciences, 89%. His parents could not believe what had happened, so they asked him how he managed to pass, and this is what he said. He said, when I went around the school, and I saw a man kneeling on the cross at every corner of the school building, I know that the teachers in this school don't joke. <laughs> and that if I don't pass my exams, they will nail me like they nailed that night. Hallelujah. On this Easter Sunday... We we'll gather together in this church and around the world to celebrate the moralization of the day when Jesus Christ rose again from the dead. He died and he rose again from the dead. If you lived in Jerusalem this weekend, uh, over 2,000 years ago, you would have seen a man and two others carrying their cross and walking across the streets of Jerusalem. Historically, if any man was seen carrying a cross... At any point in time, it means that the man had been sentenced to death to be executed by hanging on a cross. Dying on the cross was a phenomenon, was a method of crucifixion or execution that was invented by the Phoenicians. They wanted a man to die slowly. They wanted a man to die suffering. They wanted the death and the pain to be incremental so that by the time the man dies, he hangs on the cross four to six or eight hours as the case might be. He dies from suffocation because he cannot breathe well. He dies from dehydration because he has lost a lot of fluid. He dies from uh, uh, loss of blood because he has lost a lot of blood. So he dies. I, 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 I wish that Somehow in, in Africa, particularly in a place like Nigeria, the, the, the electoral officers, the INEC officers, the returning officers, who one way or the other compromise the results of our election could be sentenced to that kind of death. Let them not die suddenly. Let them die slowly, painfully, incrementally, so that people will not repeat the same mistake. This was how people died those days. So in the Roman Empire, criminals were sentenced to death by execution, dying on a cross. 
Now, death was a death that was not preserved, that was not reserved for Roman citizens. It was only for non-Roman citizens. So people were sentenced to death by carrying their cross. So on that day, Jesus Christ carried his cross and went through the streets of Jerusalem alone. In pain, in agony, not so much because he was a criminal, but because of the sins of humanity, he died a vicarious death. And with Jesus Christ, there were two other young men who also carried their cross. These two men were considered criminals. When I read the story and I reflected on it, I realized that even though sometimes we want criminals to die a miserable death, but criminals also have family members. They have parents who wish they would, this was not their sentence. They had girlfriends, I know, and you know there are some girls who like the bad boy persona. You know, they're attracted to the bad boys. So even though these guys were hardened criminals, historically they're called malefactors. They were evildoers. Some said they were thieves, hardened thieves. There were some girls who were attracted to them. In Atlanta here, yeah, there was a man called Nichols Brown, uh, Brian, Brian Nichols, who, who was sentenced to life imprisonment because he had raped a girl. And later on, he killed some officers. Even in the jailhouse, there were girls who were attracted to him. And they would visit him in the jailhouse. So these guys must have had some girlfriends who were attracted to them because they were bad boys. But Jesus Christ was not a bad boy. Jesus Christ was going to die on the cross. The cross symbolized God's plan for the redemption of man. The cross, the old rugged cross, was a place where Jesus Christ had to carry the sins of the world on that cross. It was the place where as silly, as foolish, as painful as it looked, that was the only place where man could find peace. That was the only place where Satan was going to be defeated. That was the only place where the sins of the world would be rolled away upon the shoulders of a man who did not commit any sin, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. So on that day, on that cross... Two men hung on both sides of Jesus Christ. Two men. One on his right and one on his left. And along the way, in the course of their execution, they engaged Jesus Christ in a conversation. And Jesus did not respond to all the insinuation, all the accusation, all the careless talk, all the unnecessary attack. From the other criminal. But one of them said to Jesus, he said to him, he said, Lord, will you remember me when you come to your kingdom? As I reflected on this story, I asked myself the question, why did he ask? After all, he was a hardened criminal. And if you have read how criminals die, some of them still die. They die being hostile. They die unrepentant. They die still angry at the world. Look at the drama we saw here. Even in a hall, not a hall, but the image, the portrayal was still angry, angry at what they had done to her. You are angry at what people did to you. You are angry at what people said to you. And you fail to realize that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. You are also a sinner. There are no, there are no big sin and small sin. All sins are the same. But this man, a hardened sinner, asked Jesus Christ a question. Will you remember me? Will you remember? Why did he ask did he ask because he had come to the final destination of life? Did he ask because suddenly he realized that regardless of his achievements, accomplishments, or lack of them, now he had come to the last brick wall that all of mortality must confront. And that is the world of death. It's appointed unto man wants to die. And after that comes judgment. Every man will die, regardless of how powerful you are. Republicans, uh, uh, Democrats, uh, Independents, uh, regardless of who you are. The Russians, the Ukrainians, everybody will die. Did he ask because 
he was ill? Because some people become pensive and reflective on their deathbed. Some people become pensive and reflective when they've lost a lot of money, when they've lost all their friends, when they've lost all their associates. That's when they pull back and began to think intelligently. But this man did not ask because he was sick. He asked even though he was condemned to death. There are some of you here today who have been condemned to death by your sins. The Bible says that the soul that sins, it shall die. There is something about death. There is a sting about sin. There is a sting that sin introduces. There is a poison that sin introduces into your life when you do not know the power of God to save from sin and give you victory over sin and over the devil. So this man asked a question, Lord, will you remember me? Oh, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Jesus responded. He responded. What, what, I, 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 and he responded confidently. He responded assuredly. And you wonder, what manner of man is Jesus Christ? Who would forgive his enemies even on the cross? He was dying because of these two benefactors, these two sinners. He was dying because of every sin, every iniquity that had been committed in the earth. And yet on that cross, he said, Father, forgive them. For they do not know what they do. And even in his weakness, even in his frailty, even in his aloneness, he assured this man, he said, today, 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 you will be with me in paradise. What manner of man is Jesus? What manner of man is Jesus? What manner of man is Jesus who will speak confidently in the face of death? Who will speak confidently in the face of pain? Who will speak authoritatively in the face of global, seemingly, rejection. Everybody had abandoned him and everybody had left him. Jesus said, today, today you will be with me in paradise. I want you to listen to me very well. When my eyes close in death, in that instant, I will appear before the presence of God. Why? Because I have put my faith in Jesus Christ. Not because I preach, not because I'm a pastor, not because, no, no, no. But because I have put my faith in Jesus Christ. Look at this man on the cross, on his deathbed. He had the presence of mind to say, Father, remember me. Remember me. I want to challenge you today. You are not on the cross. You are not on your deathbed. For some of you, you have never entered into a personal relationship with Christ. For some of you, you have, you have tried dating Christ. You go in occasionally, go out with him on Sunday mornings, on Monday through Saturdays. You are back doing your own stuff. And every night again on Sunday, you date him, but you are not really committed into a relationship with him. I'm inviting you this morning. I don't want you to walk out of this door without a, making a commitment to Christ. Without making a commitment to his lordship, to his authority, and to his power and purpose for your life. Jesus looked at the man. He said, I will remember you. Today, 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 I am going to. You do know what the Bible says? It says, when you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. He said, for today is the acceptable day. Now is the acceptable time. So Jesus said, I will remember you. It's interesting the request the man made. He said, Lord, remember me. And this is what I want to tell you about God. Because some of you do not know the God we serve. You don't know that God cares and God loves you very much. Number one, I want you to know that God remembers his people. He remembers his people. He remembered Anna when she had a huge need. He remembered Noah. When he was in the ark for 40 days, he remembered Sarah. He remembered Abraham. God remembers his people. There are some of you today who are wallowing in loneliness. 
You are wallowing in aloneness, in rejection. And you think nobody cares. Honey, God remembers you. God remembers his promises. When God makes a promise, he remembers. He made a promise to Abraham and Sarah. He remembered the promise. 25 years later, he fulfilled the promise. God remembers his covenants. He said, the mountains shall depart and, my man, uh, and the hills be removed. He said, but my covenant shall not depart from you. God remembers his covenant. Have you come to God? Has God made a promise to you? And even though there are storms and, and, and turbulence, and you think that, oh, well, you are all alone. I want to assure you today that God never forgets you. The Bible says in Isaiah 49 verse 15, it says, can a mother forget her suckling child? Can she forget the fruit of her womb that she will not have compassion upon her? He said, yeah, a mother may forget. He said, but I will never forget you. God remembers you. I want you to know that today. God remembers, regardless of where you are, take the wings of the morning and dwell in the utmost parts of the earth, of the earth. God remembers you, and even there, he will look for you. Another thing that God remembers is that he remembers your sins. He remembers your sins. Every sin you have committed, every sin you're going to commit, God chronicles them. He remembers them. And someday, if you don't do anything about it, when you appear before God, you will see a chronicle. You will see a dossier. You will see a, a, a production of every sin you have committed. Numbers chapter 32 verse 23. It says, I want you to know that your sins will find you out. Galatians 6, 7. It says, be not deceived. For God is not mocked. Whatever a man does, that he shall. Whatever a man sows, that he shall reap. Ecclesiastes 8, 12. It says, even though a sinner commits sins a hundred times. And his sins are not. That he doesn't get punished. He said, I want you to know that it will not be well with the sinner. God remembers your sins. He remembers your sins. Every vileness, every hatred, every murder, every abortion, every wickedness, every betrayal, every gossip. God remembers your sin. Every Yahoo, Yahoo. Every election by practice. Every electoral by practice. And by the way, a shout out to that vice chancellor who conducted the elections, I think, in Abia State who refused to be influenced by the powers that be. She stood her ground and she said, the mother in me and the pastor in me will not allow me to sacrifice the future of our nation on the altar of intimidation and harassment. Shout out to her. God remembers. But there's something else that happens apart from the fact that God remembers, God also forgets. He forgets. Glory to God. In Jeremiah chapter 31 verse 34, he says that your sins and your transgressions, I will remember no more. The sin of this criminal on the cross, without a baptism, without the rituals, religious rituals, in one instant, Jesus wiped away his sins and said that today you will be with me. And when God forgets your sins, he forgets your sins through Christ. Through the finished work of Jesus Christ on Calvary. Because the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, it says God made him to be sin for us who knew no sin. That in him we can be made the righteousness of God. Will somebody say glory to God? He can forget your sins. He can wipe away your sins. He can blot out your sins. In Isaiah chapter 53, verse 5, it says, God has laid the iniquity of us all on Jesus Christ. First Peter 2, 24, it says that he bore our sins on the tree. Hebrew 1, 3, it says he pours away our sins. He purges them away. Psalm 103, verse 12, he said, your sins are put away from you. Isaiah 43, he said, your sins are blotted out. Isaiah 38, he says, God puts your sins behind him. Behind him. Hebrews 10, 17, he said, your sins and your transgressions, I will remember no more. 
So are, are you looking for peace? Are you looking for deliverance? Are you looking for forgiveness? Are you looking for escape away from the weight and the burden of your sins? He remembers you for good. He forgets your sins only in Jesus Christ. Only in Christ. So only in Christ. So I want to ask you today, what are you going to do? I'm going to ask you this question. This question, if you watch Shark Tank, that's a question that is asked at the end of every transaction. So now, what are you going to do? I, I know for some of you, you are not hearing this message for the first time. You've heard it many times over. You go to church. Some of you, you're married to Christians. Some of you, your colleagues in the office are believers and they have preached this message to you over and over and over. When I lived in Lagos, sometimes I would take public commercial transport, sit at the back of the bus so that I can preach this message to people. I preach the message to them. I preach the message to my patients. As they slip through from time into eternity. Because this is the message of life. This is the message of hope. This is the message of redemption. Because ultimately, regardless of how long you live, you will take the final journey and go through the gates of death. And when you cross over to the other side, is it heaven or hell? Now, I know some of you are still arguing, well, that might not be hell. You, you know, when I get to hell, there will be some famous musicians, there will be some famous other criminals. The Bible said that hell is a place of pain and sorrow. But if you come to Christ, he will forgive your sins. He will blot out your sins. He will put away your sins behind him. And he will remember them no more. And should you die suddenly or gradually in young age or in old age, when your eyes close in death, you will be in the presence of God. I'm going to ask you this morning. What can you do? Number one, you can believe in Christ. You can believe in Christ. You can accept him into your life as Lord and Savior. All you need to do is just say, Father, I surrender to you. That's all. No rituals, no killing of a white goat, no killing of a red hand, no giving money. Like some of you are paying prophets to pray for you. No, none of this. You just believe in Christ and you shall be saved. That's all it takes. And when you do that, you now ask him to give you strength to live as a child. And your life will never be the same again. Do you believe that this morning? Amen. Go ahead and say amen. amen. I I'm going to pray with you right now. You've been a part of this wonderful service. This reminder of the death and the resurrection of Christ. And I want to invite you to come to him, into a personal relationship with him. Or if you, if you were with him, but you backslid, you've strayed away, and today you want to return to him. I want to give you that opportunity. As we bow our heads in prayer, I'm going to ask you to raise up your hand if you want to make that commitment to Christ today. You want to make that commitment to Christ. Don't bother about anybody else around you, because ultimately... You will stand alone in the presence of God to give an account of your life. So I, I want to invite you, raise up your hand in the aisle. Please, I want you to look at the overflow. If you're out there in the overflow, just raise up your hand and you will say, you want to make this commitment to Christ. I want to give you an opportunity. Just raise up your hand in the air so that I can pray with you. My friends, I'm sure you have been blessed by this message. 
I'm glad you were a part of the service. As you can see, God really did speak to us. I want you to tune in again same time next week for another word from the Lord. Meanwhile, you can follow us on all our social media platforms, on our YouTube channel, and also watch me on DSTV every Sunday at 3 p.m. God bless you. God bless you.